The drama continues to build, the big crowd waiting patiently but nervously for the Knievel legend to continue. Let's go back to Dave Diles with Evil Knievel. Okay, I was telling Evil, I know firsthand I had a marvelously brilliant father and a bright son. But my father got brighter as I got older, and I hope that my son someday will think I'm smart. Your kids obviously never listened to you when you told them don't ever do that, and they assured you they wouldn't. Well... Dave, nobody can tell a young man what his life is supposed to be like. Robbie is the master of his own ship. In this case tonight, I think the wind is maybe blowing in the wrong direction, but I hope he can handle it because he's going to have to. Evil, you know as well as I do that some people will say, you're a little league father who is pushing and prodding your child to do something that you could not do. Well, that's one of the most ignorant statements I've ever heard made in my life. My, I wouldn't expect that from you. My son is 26 years old. He's a young man, he's not a kid. I tried to stop him from jumping, I couldn't get the job done. And if you don't be careful when this is over, I'm gonna send him to you and you can babysit him for a couple of weeks. You'll find out what kind of a kid he is. Well, your relationship with him has been turbulent at times. Not uh, much different than any other father's has with his kids. I'm sure it has not, but you have urged him, most of all, to be careful. Down deep in your heart, you still don't want him to do this, do you? Well, if you were going through what I'm going through right now, with my mind and my heart, you'd know that I don't want him to do it, but Robbie has had this dream for a long time, and he came here with 20 years' experience. When I came here, I came here with only 10 or 11 years' experience. Robbie is a, absolutely the best performer in the world, and I think he'll get the job done. You want to salute him and walk out and say, long live the king. I am not the greatest daredevil in the world. I hope after this is over, I will be the father of the greatest daredevil in the world. Okay, Evil Knievel, moments before the jump. The overall view here in Las Vegas, this is where Robbie Knievel will soon launch himself, he hopes, into superstardom. He'll soar about 160 feet to the landing ramp at the other end, where he will have to negotiate a very narrow area as you take a look as we follow through with our cameras here at Caesars Palace. There's a good close-up of the takeoff ramp. They'll have to go over the fountains, not get any water on the wheels so as to prevent a slick landing. There's the landing ramp, the obstacles below, the challenges to his right, the pillar to his left, the pillar, the bales of hay, and in he goes into the underground garage. There's almost a sense of New Year's Eve in Times Square when you look at the awesome crowd here waiting for the magical moment. You know, back in 1967, Evil Knievel was the first to attempt this death-defying leap. However, somewhere in the crowd that particular day was a 10-year-old boy who saw Evil and said, I want to do that someday too. Well, that boy's name is Gary Wells. And that someday came 13 years later in the year 1980. Gary Wells was only the second person to attempt to jump the fountains at Caesars Palace. For Wells, that September morning was filled with promise. On September 15, 1980, it was a very special day in one way, and in another way it was the same as many others. I was attempting a motorcycle jump over the Caesars Palace Fountains in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is where I happen to grow up. And the day started by uh, waking up at 6 in the morning to uh, set the ramps.
make sure the equipment was prepared and lined up properly. And for some reason, my takeoff ramp had been moved in the six hours prior to my setting it. And at jump time, it was two degrees off. We've had five approaches so far. This appears to be at 90 miles an hour. He's up, 23 little gold wheels. He's missed it. He's in trouble. He's in trouble. He's down. He's hurt. My God, he's not even moving. He's hurt. He's hurt. I knew the second that my eyes cleared the top of the ramp. I knew immediately. So I missed the landing ramp and had a very spectacular crash. I hit a brick wall with my body head on at 85 miles an hour. The impact of that, I had to have open heart surgery, steel plates put in my legs, and uh, it was real. It was right in front of the people. People were standing within 10 feet of where I had that impact. Against all odds, Gary Wells not only survived his near fatal accident at Caesars Palace, but emerged from this crash with his courage still intact. Everybody takes risks. I just get paid for it, and I enjoy it. If there's not a risk in life, life's a bore. It is almost Robbie Knievel's turn as he becomes just the third person to attempt this feat, but Robbie is anything but new to this game. He has trained and prepared hard for this jump. He's been in the business for about 20 years. Interestingly, he does not consider himself a daredevil. Let's learn more about the career of Robbie Knievel and find out what he has accomplished. Robbie Knievel, born into a career, born to the world's most famous daredevil. Robbie was riding on his father's motorcycle as far back as he can remember. Taking over the family business came naturally to Evil Knievel too. These days, he prepares diligently in the desert near Las Vegas for his jump of a lifetime. Meanwhile, in his earlier years, Robbie and his older brother Kelly learned from their dad. By 1971, they appeared with Evil for a motorcycle bow before a full house at Madison Square Garden. But his big break came in 74 in Toronto. By the time I hit age 11, I did a show with my dad at the Toronto National Exhibition. I have quite a home in Butte, Montana, and we have eight acres, and it's surrounded by guards. And one of the guards came to me, and he said, Evil, I'm having a heck of a time with the tourists out here at the gate. He says, you're paying us 24 hours to keep the tourists so you can have your privacy. And he said, that little guy's got a sign up on the gate that says, see Evil Junior jump, only 25 cents. He said, I can't keep the people out of here. Anyway, I always wanted them to perform with me and do some writing under my guidance. At the last performance I would ever have before the canyon jump, and this is that performance, and I would like you to meet my sons, Kelly and Robbie. Me and my brother did a wheelie show. That was the last show my brother ever did with us. And I walked out at 11 years old and got on a, a 125 that was twice the size of me. And, uh, I could go through the gears all the way across the football field. It was it was so funny. I mean, the crowd was just up in a roar, you know. It was like this little guy on this bike. Neat, 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 neat. So it was great. Um, it was that, that's when I was like, hey, I want to do this for a living. And yes, he did. By 1976, Robbie was a regular on his father's tour. He performed with his dad during shows, learned from the best, gathered invaluable experience, got to see the country. January 1988 in the Houston Astrodome, a friend of mine called me up, a stunt friend of mine that's been around for years and does all different kinds of car stunts and stuff. He says, listen, if I were to jump my car head on at you, would you be interested in jumping your motorcycle coming the other way, head on over the top of me? And he would come off, destroy my takeoff ramp completely a half a second after I went over him. And I would clear his takeoff ramp because it was a lot shorter. And I'm blind, I'm coming out of a tunnel, I can't even see him, all I can see is his flag drop. And I'm sitting there revving and I go, 1,000, 2,000, and I just go, you know, as fast as I can. And I come off this ramp and I must have jumped 160 feet to the ground, splat. Knocked the wind out of me instantly, I barely held onto the bike, I had plenty of room, you know. <laughs> I was lucky and he just, he did exactly what he said. He came and went 
destroyed my takeoff ramp completely. Portland was kind of easy because it was out in the middle of nowhere. I almost flipped the bike over, but I was on a, a big racetrack at the Nissan Grand Prix. And uh, I had plenty of room, nothing to worry about at all, except getting from point A to point B. I got the perfect speed and I hit right in the middle, middle of my X, right where I wa wanted to hit. And, uh, did a no-hander quick because I started going over. I just came off the ramp a little bit the wrong way, and that's, Caesars, I'll be jumping a lot further. When you start jumping 160, 170, 180 feet where I want to land, you're really talking about coming off that ramp at that speed just perfect to kick up the rear end a little when you're flying through the air so you don't end up backwards. I mean, if my dad, when he landed at Caesars, if he would have made it over the safety ramp, he was back so far that he probably would have flipped over and crashed anyway. But uh, when you start getting back at that point, at that speed, you start losing sight and uh, you get weak. It's like, should I let go or stay with it? It becomes more dangerous when you can't make practice runs by the side of the ramp like I can't at Caesars. All I can do is make run-ups to the ramp but I got to stop short, and uh, I mean, I got to start stopping soon, and it, it's, it's, it makes it so much easier when you can go by at full speed and just get that feel going by the ramp, and then slowing down on the other side, checking out, and being able to go by the side and view the whole distance. That's one thing that could screw me up.